Ukraine is calling for more military aid from NATO, but some member states are wary of sending weapons. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu, and this is The Heat. This Friday, NATO's Ukraine Defense Contact Group will meet in Germany for talks over military aid. The U.S. Secretary of Defense was in Berlin rallying support for Ukraine's defense needs. But as Trent Murray reports, splits are emerging on the issue of tanks. Well, this visit by U.S. Secretary Austin comes as Ukraine pleads with Western powers to send their main battle tanks to help prepare for an expected Russian offensive this spring. Those calls from Kyiv are being especially directed at Berlin. The German-made Leopard 2 is amongst the most common tanks found in Europe. There's roughly 2,000 of them located across the continent in army warehouses. But because the Leopard is German-made, the German government retains a veto over them ever being resold or given to a new owner. So far, Chancellor Olaf Scholz has indicated he is prepared to use that veto, much to the annoyance of several European allies, including Finland and Poland. In a sign of how this saga is straining relations, the Polish Prime Minister said Thursday that even if Scholz tried to stop Poland giving a company of their own Leopard tanks to Ukraine, well, Warsaw would be willing to just ignore it. On the broader issue of tanks, the German government's argument has been it, quote, doesn't want to go it alone. And we're now starting to learn what that means in practice, with both Reuters and the Wall Street Journal reporting that Schultz has told US President Joe Biden that he will only lift the veto on the Leopard tanks if the US sends its own American-made Abrams tanks to Ukraine. Something Pentagon officials right now at least say is unlikely because of the difficult logistics involved. These issues will be discussed Friday by Western powers when defence ministers led by Austin will meet at the Ramstein Air Force Base here in Germany. We are expecting an announcement on another military aid package for Ukraine, which could include more ammunition or air defence systems. But it is that question over tanks which will likely remain the top priority for Ukrainians. They've told Western allies that the time for discussion has now passed and that it's time for delivery. Trent Murray, CGTN, Berlin. To discuss the situation in Ukraine, let's bring in our panel from Moscow. Pavel Felgenhaar is a defense analyst and columnist for Novaya Gazeta. From Madrid, we're joined by Pavlo Kukta. He is a former Ukrainian acting minister of economy. Marcus Papadopoulos is a historian and author specializing in Russia and the former Soviet Union. He joins us from London. And Klaus Laris is a professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, Pablo Kukta, what is going on with the supply of weapons to Ukraine when you look at this split that seems to be emerging uh, between NATO members and what Ukraine gets? I mean, how is this being seen in Kyiv? Mm, well, you know, as a person who's worked for 10 years in the government, I view this as rather normal. So it seems to me there is a... Uh, let's say, conundrum of certain political and practical issues that probably will be resolved in the coming days. Because uh, politically for Germany, it is uh, hard for several reasons to supply things. On the other hand, the Americans are quite logical, because logistically, Leopard 2 can be supported in Ukraine. There is available logistical base in Europe for that. Abrams cannot, because it's not fueled like that in Europe, and it will take some time for it to become, let's say, uh, properly positioned in Poland. And in politics and, and in statescraft, often these issues co coalesce and contradict each other, and they have to be resolved. That's essentially what politics and governance are about. I believe they will be resolved, and it's clear that new packages of weapons are coming, which are quite timely, mm -hmm. because the best way to stop this war quickly is to show Russians that, A, they cannot win on the battlefield, B, the attrition of war is unaffordable for them. Then the next logical step is negotiations okay. and ceasefire. So 
bit of head in there. Right, Pablo, there have also been some very high-level visitors from the European Union to uh, Ukraine. The uh, uh, European Council President, Charles Michel, has been in Kyiv. He's been holding talks with President Zelensky. And one of the things that Michel said, he said, we reiterate the EU's commitment to Ukraine. What does that mean when he says we reiterate the EU's commitment to Ukraine? I mean, does the, any of that commitment include perhaps fast-tracking Ukraine into EU membership or into NATO? Mm, we will see about that. I uh, think that at this point, this means that Ukraine will be supported by the EU until the very end in this war, which is clear and normal. As for the fast-tracking of membership, let's see about that. Uh, joining the EU is a very, very grand process. So I would really hope that Ukraine joins soon, but uh, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't give my forecast at this point. I think this is more about getting through this war, stopping the chaos and madness, returning the situation back to normal. Pavel Falkenhauer, what does this look like from uh, Moscow? Uh, we're hearing Ukraine appeal for more weapons from NATO. They are getting some of those weapons. Russia, for its own uh, self, is uh, ramping up production of its weapons. But how does it view this? Well, it's seen as a very dangerous situation. There have been public pronouncements from former President Dmitry Medvedev, who is also right now uh, Deputy uh, uh, Chief of the Russian Security Council, Deputy to President Putin, and from the Orthodox Patriarch Kirill about the th threat of uh, Russia uh, losing a conventional war, which can escalate into something nuclear. So uh, the uh, continued supply of new weapons and the increased capabilities of these weapons are really uh, seen as a big problem because it's not everyone's talking about leopard tanks, but they are things that are actually much more potent than in the leopard tanks that are going to arrive right soon, apparently, with the Ukrainians. It's new American missiles that will give their HIMARS uh, launch systems a, a double their capability to 150 kilometers mm -hmm. of precision strikes. And that can really be a game changer. And it's seen as a great, grave threat. Marcus Papadopoulos, uh, there was a headline in the New York Times, and the New York Times often reflects the United States government viewpoint, but this headline said, US warms to helping Ukraine target Crimea. Now, Russia considers Crimea an undisputed part of uh, undisputed Russian territory. If Ukraine targets Crimea, how great are the risks that this conflict could escalate and escalate very seriously? Well, one of the striking features of the war in Ukraine is the willful distortion by Western governments and Western mainstream media of the reality on the battlefield in Ukraine because ever since the Russian military campaign commenced in Ukraine on the 24th of February of last year, the West has portrayed the Russian armed forces as a third-rate power. Now, anyone who believes that is quite simply a gullible, ignorant fool, because Russia is a military superpower. Secondly, the Russian military industrial complex, which has its origins in the Soviet period, is tasked with and capable of sustaining the Russian armed forces in a protracted con uh, conventional war with the United States of America. It therefore follows that not only is the Russian military able to completely defend the Crimea, but also the Russian military is winning the war in Ukraine and will emerge victorious, regardless of what military equipment yeah. the Americans, the British and the Germans may decide to send to Ukraine. And regarding the German Leopard tanks, mm. well, quite frankly, if the decision is given yeah. for Germany to send those tanks to Ukraine, how can 10 tanks or 20 tanks be a game changer? 
Yeah. Marcus, just one question. I mean, you say Russia is a military superpower, but, you know, this war is going to be, it'll be almost a year old in just about a month's time. Uh, if it is a superpower, it appears to be struggling. Well, Russia has not been fighting against the Ukrainian armed forces solely. Indeed, Russia is fighting against the whole of NATO. This is a war, effectively, between NATO and Russia. Indeed, in recent days, the Ukrainian defense minister admitted, admitted that Ukraine is carrying out NATO's mission against Russia, which means Ukraine is fighting NATO's war against Russia. And despite right. the huge amounts of weaponry which NATO has sent to Ukraine, the Russians have destroyed vast amounts of it, so much so that the Americans, the Canadians, the British and the Germans have depleted their own stockpiles. So this is not a war yeah. between Russia and Ukraine per se. This is a war between NATO and Russia. OK, Klaus Laris, what is your response to what you just heard there? Well, <laughs> it's always the same I hear from my colleague in London. Of course, the Russians invaded Ukraine and not the other way around. You get the impression that the Russians have been attacked. The Russians attacked Ukraine, which was totally unnecessary. They provoked that war. And uh, on the battlefield, the Russians are not doing as well as they thought they would. You know, they could not conquer uh, uh, Kiev within a few days or a few weeks. And they have lost territory uh, on the whole. They are actually struggling enormously with their mobilization, with their conscripts, with their weapons, their ammunition, even with their generals. They have already had a few change of uh, general co supreme command of the Russian army. All that shows they are in great difficulties. And the leopards, if they get uh, sent to Ukraine, and I think in the end, uh, German Chancellor Scholz will give his permission to re-export these leopard tanks to Ukraine. Yeah. Of course, we are talking about 12 or 14. The, the Western military said that 100 would make a difference. And right. the idea to, to reconquer uh, the territory Russia has taken from Ukraine and perhaps even go to Crimea. Yeah. And I'm not saying they will manage to do that, but they have a good chance of doing that, certainly with the help of these leopard tanks. OK, Klaus, I want to talk about European unity. And we've been hearing a lot about that over the past few months, how Europe remains unified in the face of this conflict, how European nations, NATO members, are marching in lockstep uh, on this particular issue. But, you know, if we look at the dispute that's arisen because of the, uh, uh, of the tanks between uh, Germany and Poland on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, if we look at this past weekend, the Croatian president, Zoran Milanovic, said the United States and NATO are engaged in a proxy war against Russia through Ukraine. He was speaking at, uh, in the eastern city of Vukovar at a conference there. Milanovic also slammed Western sanctions against Russia. Now, we know that Croatia is both a member of NATO and the EU. Um, and on the question of training Ukrainian troops, he said, or posed the question rather, what should we be, America's slaves? I mean, do these comments and what's happened call into question European unity? There are some divergent voices, this is very true. Croatia is one, also particularly the Hungarian uh, Prime Minister Orban is another one. And now with the decision about the leopard tanks, we clearly see there is some division. However, I think that division will be quickly overcome. There was also some division regarding the energy crisis, which uh, quickly was overcome. And at the moment, the energy situation in Europe is actually looking much, much better yeah. than it was only a couple of months ago. So it would be, as my Ukrainian colleague said, it would be a miracle if all the 27 members of uh, uh, the EU and the even more members of NATO always agreed in instantly. But that is, of course, a matter of negotiation and talks. But in the end, I'm pretty positive that unity will be maintained. Pablo, you know, one of the challenges that we face in this conflict is getting a very clear picture on the status of the battle. It's been very difficult. Um, the United Kingdom said at the end of last month that Russia is continuing to reinforce its forces along the front line in the Luhansk region. What can you tell us about the status of the battle in that part of Ukraine right now? 
Well, again, if you watch the map carefully and do it with an open mind and clear head, you'll see that the front line is essentially static since Ukraine retook the southern region of Crimea. Uh, so thus far, there have been very, very heavy battles in the Donbas region. Uh, near Bakhmut, the town of Solidar, very heavy combat there, a lot of casualties on both sides. Russians took that town. But again, these are all very, very minor changes. So ultimately, uh, on what matters is on a strategic scale, the front line is stable. And yeah. uh, what about the bring yeah. yeah, what about the battle for Bakhmut? We've been hearing a lot about that. Uh, it's considered a key city for uh, Ukraine and for Russia. Mm, well, in fact, it is not. I mean, let's be frank about it. This is already called the 21st century Verdun. If you remember history, Verdun was a very bloody battlefield between the French and the Germans in mm -hmm. the First World War which was not really strategically that important. Bakhmut is the same. So even if Ukraine has to retreat from Bakhmut, yep. there is a second line that prepared behind it. Probably the same is true for Russia. Okay. So it's a bloody battle, but it's not really the one that will decide the fate of the war. Yeah. Marcus, the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, he's been talking uh, about the conflict. Let's listen to what he had to say. Just as Napoleon mobilized almost all of Europe against the Russian Empire, just as Hitler mobilized and conquered most of the European countries to launch them against the Soviet Union, the United States has now organized a coalition of almost all the Europeans in NATO and beyond, members of the European Union as well. So, Marx, what do you make of what Lavrov said there and his sort of historic framing, historical framing of the conflict? Historical comparisons can often be problematic, and I would have worded the situation quite differently. However, it is the case that the Americans ultimately rule Europe. When the Americans want the Germans, for example, to do something, they will not negotiate with them, they will intimidate them they will blackmail them. And as a result of that, the Americans ever since 1989, and in particular following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, have expanded their empire from Western Europe to Central Europe and into Eastern Europe. And they have conjoled all of those nations against Russia. However, whilst the ruling elites in Europe slavishly obey America, because after all, their wealth and their status depends on America, ordinary people in Europe are opposed to the war in Ukraine. Yeah. They are opposed to the, e the vast amount of money being sent to Kiev and the vast amount of weaponry being sent to Kiev. Now, yeah, those Marcus. people you will never hear. Right. Marcus, when you say the United States threatens, intimidates, blackmails European nations to do its will, where is the evidence of that? Well, I cite you the case of Nord Stream. At the beginning of 2022, Joe Biden explicitly threatened to destroy Nord Stream. And then last year, the Nord Stream pipelines were severely damaged. That was a way of the Americans ending Germany's trade with Russia and making Germany solely dependent on America for liquefied natural gas. So that is how the Americans treat their so-called allies. Mm. They simply intimidate them, they bully them, they blackmail them. And I want to say as well mm. that there is no such thing as NATO unity or European unity. That is simply a myth propagated by the Western ruling elites. And when we hear the Western ruling elites cite yeah. the opinion poll findings of institutes in Europe, we should discard those because yeah. those institutes are neither independent nor free. They are controlled by the Western ruling elites, as Western mainstream media All right. is controlled by the Western ruling elite. All right, Marcus, I'm going to get to Klaus Laris. Klaus, uh, I want to get back to that comment that, uh, that Sergei Lavrov made there, um, that this is a conflict 
It's just the latest conflict and a long effort by West European countries and the United States to conquer Russia. This is, of course, not true. If Russia had not invaded Ukraine almost a year ago, no one would be fighting Russia. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the Clinton administration very actively tried to integrate Russia into the global order. This did not work out. Certainly, partially also, there were, were mistakes made on the Western side, but there were also uh, mistakes made on the Russian side, and Putin then increasingly became un. Uh, 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 uncooperative. Instead of that, he invaded uh, Georgia, he invaded then 2014 uh, Crimea, and we saw the, uh, the latest invasion. No one wants to be a hostile to Russia. It is uh, Russia who has invaded other countries. Ukraine, U Ukraine has not invaded Russia. No NATO country has invaded Russia. The Baltic states are members of NATO and uh, neighbors of Russia. Poland is as well. They have not invaded Russia. They are not thinking of invading yeah, Russia. Klaus, Klaus does, not, does that not ignore the fact that uh, NATO expanded eastwards after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, in violation of a promise that it made to Russia that the United States played a key role in the coup that took place in Ukraine in 2014, uh, that there was out there an offer that Ukraine could possibly become a member of NATO and that Russia felt that this would pose a direct threat to its security. Yeah, NATO expansion is very controversial, and I'm not convinced that it was the right policy to do. Uh, but it still hasn't led to invasion of any NATO country of Russia. Russia has invaded foreign countries. If Putin had grievances, some of them, of course, justified grievances, then you uh, you uh, talk about these grievances. Yeah, but he presented a peace plan, a blueprint for European security at the end of 2021. But you do not invade a foreign country. That was that before the, the invasion. Uh, so, uh, say that again, I'm sorry. The Russians did present a blueprint for European security, uh, basically a reworking of European security in December of 2021, <laughs> but that was ignored. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And also the neutrality option, which was being discussed yeah. before the war, should have been taken more seriously. Okay. I quite agree with that. I'm not saying the West did not miss opportunities. Mm -hmm. However, you miss opportunities, the reaction should not be to invade a country. Right. Uh, that is simply unacceptable. Uh, and Russia is the aggressor here. All right, I want to move on. Pavel Felgenhauer, the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, says the way to a negotiated settlement, and uh, Pavel talked about this earlier, he said the way to a settlement is by supplying Ukraine with more weapons. Let's listen to what Stoltenberg said. If we want a negotiated peaceful solution to the war in Ukraine, we need to provide military support to Ukraine. That's the only way. Uh, weapons, uh, uh, they are the way to peace. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that may sound like a paradox, but, uh, but the only way to have a negotiated uh, agreement is to convince President Putin that he will not win on the battlefield. He has to sit down and, uh, and negotiate. So, Pavel, how is this going to be seen in Moscow? Um, I mean, the Russians, are they considering that they will be forced to sit down and negotiate from a position, really, of weakness from what Stoltenberg is saying? The uh, official line is that Russia will win this war no matter what, and that Western military aid to Ukraine is prolonging the war, but they can't uh, negate Russia's uh, ultimate victory. Uh, that's the official and propaganda line. Uh, of course, it's understood in Moscow that there are serious problems with the mobile, uh, with the Russian military, which didn't manage to win as a standing military a swift victory, achieve it in Ukraine. And now there are problems with mobilizing, especially mobilizing the defense industry to sustain the present level, rather high level of. Uh, uh, fighting and the loss of equipment and supply munitions. Uh, so Russia would actually want right now very much a ceasefire, uh, but a ceasefire which would basically freeze the present situation. Basically, as it was already said today, mm. uh, the front lines are frozen for the last couple of months. Right. More. So uh, the, uh, freezing the, the line, negotiating a kind of uh, Minsk 3 uh, 
ceasefire based on the kind of status quo. That's what Russia would want. That's what Ukraine does not want. It hopes that it can push the Russians back further. Yeah. So both sides are preparing for the, the line of uh, the front line is stable, but both sides are preparing yeah. for a decisive show, military showdown. Okay. So right now, uh, negotiating a ceasefire, not even a peace, just a ceasefire, yeah. is precarious when both sides are preparing for a big fight, either now, mm -hmm. while the winter continues, or late in spring, maybe late uh, uh, April, May, yeah. when the uh, soil begins to dry up, and then both sides are tr trying to go mobile. Yeah. and score a victory that will give them a, a position to negotiate from a position of strength. Right. Uh, Pablo Kutka, uh, on the question of supplying weapons to Ukraine, um, if NATO wants Ukraine to get the upper hand, one would imagine that NATO would be supplying Ukraine with the most sophisticated weapons it has at its disposal right now, so that they'd be, as NATO wants, a quick resolution to this conflict. Ukraine would have the upper hand because it would have these powerful weapons. Why hasn't that happened? I'm sorry, I had a short connection disruption. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we um, have to understand the practicalities of all this thing. First of all, no one really expected Russia to attack. We in Ukraine, while knowing that the danger was there, had calculations showing us that Russians would not win, which is in fact what happened. This was a big blunder on their part. And after this big blunder, everyone got mired up in a conflict, which is dragging on, costing lives, really is for nothing, uh, but uh, is very hard to manage on all sides, militarily included, right? Europe was not preparing and NATO was not preparing with the war with Russia. We're not in Cold War. Cold War is 30 years past. Neither is the Russian army, as some people have said here, some kind of Soviet military or something. It's a shadow of that. It's nothing short, nothing, nothing close to that. Yeah. No one was prepared for this. It's a problem for everyone, which is why the best solution is to end this fast. Yeah. And the fastest way, of course, would be for Russians to simply retreat from Ukrainian territory, restore the status quo, and then proceed to negotiate whatever they need to negotiate on the security Okay. Framework. Okay, but we, if things there are not going that way, the second best solution is to kick them out. That's yeah. as simple as that. Okay, time has caught up with us. We are going to have to end it there. Thank you to all of you for being with us on the show. And that is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C.